Hey everybody, it's Dan and Ron, and this is a nominee. Welcome uh, back. Welcome back, and uh, we just finished doing Ron's top ten movies of the 2010s, and now we're gonna do uh, my top ten TV shows of the 2010s because I largely eschewed going out to the movies to watch ungodly sums of television. Um, <laughs> so I have my list on a piece of paper. Uh, I have the thing on the bottom of my list and the thing on the top of my list noted everything else is kind of whatever order i mean and you, you're probably going to go through this and be like oh this sounds kind of interesting to me this doesn't so i don't feel like the order is really that important except for like people who like arguing about those things in comment sections we don't have any comment sections as far as i know outside of twitter so if, if you want to uh, argue about my lack of numbering uh do it on twitter hmm. we always love to hear your complaints there's also also, uh, we have Facebook. People could also comment there, and mm. uh, people can also comment on the main site at anomaly.com. If you're listening to the podcast by going directly to the site, there's comment. There's a comment section there. Oh, we'll awesome. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Plenty of opportunities for comments. So, in having said that, I'm actually going to open with one that was not my number one or my number ten, uh, just because... Oh. Can I pause you for one oh, second? Sure. I just have one question. Are you doing no spoilers, or are you going to talk about these and any Anything goes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to you know, largely issue spoilers. I may mention parts of specific episodes. The shows that I'm talking about, by and large, were not heavily narrative, or they they weren't the kind of things where you can spoil them exactly. Okay. Um, so I may mention some some highlights, but you know, if there is like a big ending reveal, I'm not going to give away the ending reveal. Although uh, with my number ten, I will mention that I, I did not like the ending at all. But, okay. Uh, you'll, you'll find out about that soon. Okay. We can always say spoiler for that one. So, so yeah. these aren't really spoilers. Like you said, highlights, an episode here and there, but but not. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to give you a taste of it. I'm sure some of this stuff you probably have seen. But anyway, so the first one I want to talk about is the least known one, just in case, because I have been evangelizing this show to anyone and everyone who will listen for as long as I I've known about it. Uh, <laughs> nobody knows about this because it only aired. It's free on YouTube. All of it's free on YouTube. So if you finish this podcast and you're like, I don't feel adequately entertained, go watch it. Um, I give it my highest possible recommendation. That's if you want to go into a YouTube hole? I I, I guess. I, I don't know. I mean, I you, guess could, you could finish watching the entire run of this show as far as I know. I don't know if there's going to be a second season. Uh, you could finish watching all of it in about two hours and it does oh. play pretty well as a as kind of a like backdoor feature film I guess um, two hours to watch the entire run of the show okay now I'm intrigued so it's called the show about the show uh, for those of you who know me uh, you know that I'm a huge fan of the filmmaker the experimental documentary filmmaker Kaveh Zahedi uh, he's made some of the most bizarre and interesting uh, autobiographical biographical documentaries ever made and he's just been pumping them out since 1991 he was his first film uh, a little stiff debuted at Sundance the same year as Reservoir Dogs and a couple other things uh, his career has taken a vastly different trajectory than uh, in uh, what, what was the first Robert Rodriguez movie where the guy's got the machine gun in the guitar case uh, shit, whatever the name uh, El Mariachi it was the same year I believe is both El Mariachi and uh, and Reservoir Dogs and Clerks actually. I remember oh, yeah. Clerks was no. later. Clerks was ninety three. So ninety four. Ninety four. Okay, so Clerks was a little bit later. Um, Pulp Fiction came out uh, ninety four, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So nineteen ninety one, he comes out with a little stiff, uh, but he's also directed. Uh, I don't hate Las Vegas anymore, which is hilarious and very hard to describe. Uh, I am a sex addict, which is fascinating, much easier to describe. It's just a kind of document of his 20-year sex addiction. Um, I, I don't hate Las Vegas anymore. I love that movie. It's um, The basic premise is he decides he's going to take ecstasy with his younger brother and his father in a Las Vegas hotel room. Oh, God. Oh. And <laughs> he's going to just leave the camera on and let God direct the movie. Oh. And it's, it's hilarious. It's heartwarming. And it's definitely 
definitely the strangest drug movie ever made. Um, Actually, you know, I said, oh, God, it's like, oh, oh, you know, it's one thing if they all took, like, heroin together or whatever, but ecstasy, everybody's happy and feels good in ecstasy, and every, and you love everyone, and it's wonderful. Okay, I could see it being heartwarming. I didn't think at first you were going to say that, but, yeah, it's, I mean, knowing from my from my experience with it, it's meager. It's meager, but, <laughs> but, 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 you know, you only a few, you only need a, a few times to go and, you know, know what it's all you need is once to know what it's like so. and yeah and and so the, it's called the show about the show and he goes to brooklyn public access also known as brick tv b-r-i-c uh and he pitches this show called daisy chain uh which is going to be somebody describes an awkward sexual experience they had every episode and then he asks like somebody who he interviewed about the awkward sexual experience about another awkward sexual experience in the next episode and so like the sexual daisy chain the show just sort of spirals out with these weird uh, sexual experiences the brooklyn public access executives say we have no interest in this and so he says okay how about this i make a show where every episode is a making of documentary of the previous episode <laughs> the pilot is you rejecting my first pitch for this different show and they're like yes yeah, sign us up and he just sort of slowly ruins his life by filming all of it you have three or four actors sometimes playing the same real person who you've seen on video uh you it's it's incredibly hard it's hilarious but it's also deep personal affecting it's maybe my favorite thing that Kaveh Zahedi has ever done and I'm like the world's biggest Kaveh Zahedi fan going <laughs> way way back uh, except maybe Kaveh Zahedi because it takes a certain sense of yourself to keep filming your most awkward moments uh, to share them with the world but it's so good I showed it to the podcast aka my girlfriend and Elizabeth the podcast Elizabeth the podcast and we were just going to watch one episode. I would already seen the entire thing and we went through the entire thing in one night because it was, and then she was like, I need to see every other movie this guy's ever done. And we watched, and she doesn't really like watching movies that much. So the fact that she was insisting we watch three other of this guy's movies within a week says something. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. And again, free on YouTube. If you can get onto YouTube, show about the show. Um, so, okay, now to go in more kind of in order. My number 10 is Breaking Bad. Uh, this really? is... Really? Yes. It's, it's, it's at number 10? It's at number 10. Huh. Uh, because... This isn't, this isn't, sorry, I just, just want to say before, uh, I, I'm not saying this because, oh, how could you possibly have made that choice on put 10? It's just, I've heard you talk about it, that I'm surprised it's <laughs> that Anywhere low. Anywhere on the, oh. No, 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 no I'm so, so, sorry, I stopped you. Oh, yeah, no, no, because, no, no, no. It's uh, it steals a lot from The Sopranos. Granted, any TV drama after The Sopranos basically has stolen, except for some of the things on this list, have has it's taken something from The Sopranos. It's hard not to take something from The Sopranos because <laughs> The Sopranos did so many things first on TV. I mean, uh, Silence in the twenties. I remember Buster Keaton uh, stealing stuff from The Sopranos. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it goes, <laughs> but like in anything on. on any like TV drama that was on after The Sopranos, especially on pay cable where you could get away with it. Uh, Breaking Bad, I think, is the most egregious example of things being taken from The Sopranos. There's a famous episode of both The Sopranos and of Breaking Bad where it's a, uh, a criminal quote-unquote mastermind and his protege slash surrogate son uh, disposing of a body. Um, I don't think that really spoils anything, uh, but there are long drawn out sequences in the shows. The issue is, is that Breaking Bad, wherever it, it did something the Sopranos did, the Sopranos did it better. The reason why it's still on my top 10, though, is the cinematography is amazing. The acting is amazing. Brian Cranston uh, is another guy that I would put on, like, I would watch that man act in any thing. When I finished Breaking Bad, I immediately went through all of Malcolm in the Middle. <laughs> I was going to bring that up. <laughs> Malcolm in the Middle was a, an amazing show. Yeah. 
and his acting on that show is brilliant. Um, however, the the ending was bad to the level of being offensive and defeats the entire premise of the show. Mm. Uh, I guess that's not really a spoiler, but when you get there, I guess you'll, or if you already got there... Prepare to be disappointed. Prepare to be disappointed. It, well, no, that was, that was the greatest weakness of the show, is that on the one hand, it wants to be this moral parable about this man's descent into be, becoming an ugly, homicidal monster because he doesn't have health insurance. But the excitement of the cinematography and uh, Vince Gilligan, uh, the showrunner, he has this very misplaced sense of how to empathize with his characters, which I don't believe The Sopranos suffered with quite as much, uh, where if you're not watching carefully or you're not watching with some kind of general sense of right and wrong, it's very easy to see it as an escapist fan power fantasy about being kind of a powerless male in U.S. society and then suddenly realizing that A, you're a genius, B, you're the boss, and C, you could do anything and get away with it, which is uh, very dangerous fantasies in, yeah. in this day and age. Um, I have a really hard time, and I think I think you mentioned it earlier, uh, or you mentioned it when I was talking about uh, my favorite movies. Um, the you're anti-hero talk- thing, you're, yeah, and I was yeah. basically talking about Breaking Bad with that. Okay, yeah, I have a really hard time with shows in which the, the, the protagonist is the bad guy. So, so yeah. the antihero, um, and uh, that's that's actually why I stopped watching Game of Thrones. Um, besides it just the the violence and especially the sexual violence, um, but there were no good people in that show. They were all nasty, power hungry people. Um, they were killers. Um, so yeah. Anyways, right, and I, I feel like from that description, it sounds like Game of Thrones is at least more honest about it. Whereas I feel like Breaking bad it wants Walter White aka Brian Cranston's uh, protege character to come across as sort of he's got a heart he's just in a bad place and ended up with the wrong people it comes across as kind of disingenuous uh, and that's a big issue at the same time if you want to watch like a, a six season cat and mouse chase um, the writing as just sort of this this thriller kind of like David Lynch in in a shallow way uh, show it's as good as it gets it's it's thrilling there's a lot of great shots uh, the sense of pacing is excellent and it, it is an, an exceptionally well-made piece of television despite my uh, my many misgivings about it well it's a, uh, with, in terms of the ending I get I, I, I only watched a few episodes I wasn't a fan of the show um, so you know I have no intention of watching the whole thing but just what you're saying about uh, the the well you said more than disappointing ending the the bad ending and offensive and and, and all that uh well i mean if I, I can spoil it if you want no 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 you the, ever want to watch the show but. no 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 i'm not I'm, I'm i'm not interested in that um i'm sorry i'm taking a long mm-hmm. time to get to my point <laughs> it's i can watch a really good movie and if it has if a bad ending as far as i'm concerned the movie sucks um and and sort of the reverse a, a mediocre movie with a great ending that that i feel redeems it and i'm i'm ha- i'm i end up coming out happy uh that that i that i saw that because of the way it uh, uh the, the ending there and i guess i've watched enough tv where like tv is um if if you're expecting coherent endings and you're watching tv that was made before maybe the last 20 years you're almost never going to get them uh-huh. just because it it sort of lives and dies by the network ratings so you have a lot of weird like i think my favorite non ending in a tv show was uh, ALF when they canceled ALF <laughs> and they're like oh well maybe we can get renewed if we end it on a cliffhanger so it just ends with ALF getting kidnapped by the FBI we never see uh, or the, the CIA or wh- whoever's running Area 51 mm-hmm. um, we Men never see him come back it's the men in black. And then they realize that it's the last episode of the show. We're left with the implication that Alf's off getting dissected somewhere. And then they show us those like really saccharine freeze frames of him having fun with the uh, the family over the credits at the end. And that's just the end of the show. Um, 
anyway, but how, how did I get from... <laughs> oh, we're talking about bad endings. Bad, Spoiling yeah, things, and that's yeah. kind of... It's... I don't even want to say that's a bad ending, because it's, like, unintentionally this sort of brilliant, like, total tone fuck with the rest of Al. Um, <laughs> and I'm still thinking about it years later. Uh, anyway, so the next... Uh, By the way, I watched... The first, it was five seasons? Four. Four seasons, and yeah. I probably watched the first three religiously. I mean, when when it was first aired, um, and then the last, I know I did not finish the last season. I got tired of it for whatever reason. Um, so I never, I don't remember that. Unless I saw it, and I just don't remember it, and I blocked it out of my, I blocked it oh, out yeah, of my like, mind for it, obvious reasons. My, my brother-in-law, who's probably about your age, I think, when I mentioned this to him, he was like, he would just like put his fingers in his ears, and he's like, like, wow, 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 I often <laughs> get dissected. That's fucked up. Why are you ruining my childhood, Daniel? Um, so if I just ruined your childhood... Um, but you just ruined mine. I'm, I'm surprised that the internet has not done that yet. Well, I haven't been doing too many Google searches for ALF. <laughs> Maybe now I will. <laughs> I got to see the uh, the finale. The finale, or the, it's, the cliffhanger. It's a singular piece of television. Let's mm-hmm. just put it like that. So my uh, my next one I want to go over is Enlighten, uh, which uh, stars and was co-created by uh, Laura D- Laura Dern, and uh, it doesn't star, but he does have a part in it, and he's done a lot of great TV writing in the background. He wrote some of the best episodes of Freaks and Geeks, but Mike White, who uh, is a very talented guy, Enlighten. It was on HBO for two years uh, and it's sort of a reversal of the HBO formula. This woman leaves her corporate job and decides that she's going to become a better person by taking on the system. It doesn't really sugarcoat what taking on the system looks like. Uh, the writing is both very funny but not in a way that's or it's, it's funny in a way that isn't cheap. Uh, Laura Dern, great actress I, I haven't really seen her play like do a bad job at anything and this is no exception uh, and it tends to get overlooked a lot in the overall HBO especially for something that's in like the post Sopranos HBO canon because grand like anything pre-Sopranos that isn't Larry Sanders or Mr. Show is basically buried and doesn't exist at the, like you can't find most episodes of The Hitchhiker which was their first drama series uh, you can't find episodes of uh, Brain Games which was this animation but that that's a whole other 80s HBO is by and large on obtainium. It's really hard to get a hold of that stuff. So, but this was in the last decade, not in the 80s. This was in the last. Okay, this okay. was, I believe, 2010 to 2011. Okay. Uh, and it was it was very good, and it was kind of I was surprised because she never really uh, done a lot on the other side of the camera that I was aware of, and she, uh, you know, she does a great job with this. Um, I'm sure you know Mike White helped out with that but you know just a, a good team going in making a good show so so I, I'm a Laura Dern fan Laura Dern's great um, I'm not so actually it's, it's great to hear about both sides of the camera um, I'm I don't care for Mike White that much um, but I think part of it I think part of it has to do with an early movie he was in Chuck and Buck oh I never saw Chuck and Buck I, I couldn't was Chuck and Buck I'm guessing you you did not like Chuck and Buck it, it was it, it was odd the way I felt about it. On the one hand, I thought it was, uh, I actually thought it was a good movie uh, and I enjoyed it and some of the stuff that it wrestled with was, was interesting. On the other hand, it portrayed, it effectively portrayed homosexuality as a developmental disorder. Oh, okay. So that's a bit of a problem and, and, and I always feel anything that he's been in that he's a little weirdly creepy. A oh little... yeah, no, he gives off like a total creepy bite and I feel like, so I guess I only know him from the TV work. I feel like he he at least got the writer credit on what I thought was the absolute best episode of Freaks and Geeks where they play to his creepiness brilliantly. Uh, it's the one where uh, Kim and oh God, uh, Lindsay Weir, uh, they start hanging out, and Lindsay sees Kim's house and sees the dysfunction and everything, and he shows up as her, like, sleeping uncle on the couch that they're all arguing about, which I thought was the perfect Mike White role. 
the, um, the so he was the creepy uncle on the couch pretty, pretty much yeah okay. and and I, that's my favorite episode of freaks and geeks i think it's the fourth one um i have the dvds over there i could look it up but my next one i'll bring up i'm sure a lot of people have seen this bojack horseman i was told i, I asked for some advice on what to watch and i was told uh usually asked one person in particular i always asked for advice for movies that's for example how i learned about the fits and tony erdman well then it turned out that you know everybody well everybody quote unquote the kahir du cinema which is <laughs> clearly the international <laughs> consensus on these things right <laughs> So, so there's a friend of mine who I go to asking for movie recommendations, Tony Erdman, et cetera. Um, so this time I actually asked for TV recommendations. Just, you know, is there any TV out there that I really absolutely should watch? So, or actually my friend was talking a little bit. He made some reference to some stuff. So he, he suggested Bojack Horseman, who I thought was just some goofy show about a guy with the head of a horse or something. So it, and it kind of is for the first two or three episodes. It takes a while. It takes a couple episodes to find its footing uh and a lot of the humor is punny goofy and not quite what you would expect about a show that's primarily about uh addiction and depression it can be kind of repetitive in the same ways as depression and addiction uh but it seems every time it, it goes through the cycle again it has something new and interesting to say uh about about both of those things it builds up this very large um, not quite Simpson size, but uh, in terms of animated shows, like you're almost Simpsons level massive universe of these different goofy characters. Uh, and when a joke lands, like there's an episode about J.D. Salinger coming out of hi hiding to create a game show. <laughs> that's one of the best things I've seen on TV in the last 10 years, obviously. Yeah, oh, totally. Oh, I need to watch it just for that. Oh yeah, and it's it's just as good as that premise suggests. And Elizabeth the podcast has just entered the control room. But yeah, Will uh, Will Arnett gives a great performance as BoJack Horseman. Aaron Paul, who uh, you may know as Walt's protege on Breaking Bad, does a great job. Uh, Allison Brie is uh, mm. she's always been great in everything I've seen her in. So now you've got to watch Captain Marvel. <clears throat> oh, apparently, yeah. I mean, she was probably my favorite i didn't really like mad men that much honestly but she was great on mad men she uh captain marvel my spoiler for that is that captain marvel man spreads <laughs> Cool. All right. So I need to watch BoJack Horseman. Uh, you know what? I watched the first two or three episodes, so I haven't quite. So yeah. So just skip right. the yeah. skip those and just go right ahead to the meat. Yeah, <laughs> the horse meat. The meat of the horse. Yeah. 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 I mean, you just it's illegal it. now. Okay. So so BoJack Horseman. Uh, it's coming to the last eight episodes are gonna come out in the next month or two. Uh, and it's just been getting progressively better as it's gone on, and it even had a great one season and spinoff show called Tuca and Birdie, which if you if you like BoJack Horseman, but you're like, oh, it's a little too dude or horse centric, <laughs> uh, Tuca and Birdie um, has a, a somewhat different vibe, but it's uh, very clearly from the same universe, has the same sense of humor, and uh, should have been given a second season uh, if you're listening Netflix. So Toucan as in uh, Toucan the Fruit Loops uh, bird? Uh, well, it's so it's a it looks like the Fruit Loops bird, and uh, but the name is a Tuca, so T U C A. Next up on the list, uh, we got uh, five down, five to go, so we're halfway through. Has it really been already five? It's already been five, yeah. I, wow. I, was, I was not kidding when I said I could bang through these pretty darn quick. Yeah, wow, this is going to be a short episode. So, Atlanta, Donald Glover, I was going to put Community on the list. I do love Community. Oh, yeah. Um, community, it was kind of all over the place. But when it was brilliant, it was unbelievably brilliant. I feel like Dan Harmon is kind of the Kanye West of TV sitcoms in that he just sort of like dumps all of his psychological problems into his work. But he uh, at least he well, Kanye West has stopped being self-effacing in earnest about his problems. So Dan Harmon, I think, is the winner here. But, <laughs> uh, That's community. Not yeah, Atlanta. Com community. Yeah, okay. um, but Donald Glover, he starts out on community leaves community to do Atlanta, which 
at the time. I wasn't that crazy about it because Donald Glover was great on Community. Unfortunately, Chevy Chase was a bit too much like his character on Community, and Donald Glover mm. had had enough of it. But thankfully for us, it turns out that Donald Glover is a genius at making TV, and Atlanta was um, just every episode was like its own brilliant short film. Great characters, um, unpredictable structure, took a lot of, you know, did a lot of bizarre experiments that paid off beautifully. Um, it's funny, it's creepy, it, it can succeed as, as both a sitcom, a horror show, a drama, you name it, depending on what it wants to do. Um, it has one of the dis most distinctively strange senses of humor or literally anything on television uh, and I'm excited for the third season to come out uh, although it could take a while because FX has kind of given uh, Donald Glover the deal that Louis C.K. had before he started jerking off in front of people or I guess before No, he'd been knew, doing that for a while. Before they before knew he'd... he'd been jerking off in front of people uh, and honestly I did like Louis when it was on Louis took a lot of chances to did some great stuff uh, before it got uh, canceled, both in the larger cultural sense and uh, by FX, presumably. Um, Atlanta is the better show, um, even oh, yeah. if I was oh, yeah. going to try to be contrarian. Um, uh, there, were the episode of Louis where where he like looks at the house and thinks he's going to buy it, and then realizes he doesn't have the money. Is was Pete? Well, it was probably the best short film that Louis C.K. ever made. But again, you you know you got to keep it in your pants Louis so um, <laughs> and also but, Atlanta was just a better show and FX uh, FX is still giving Donald Glover the space to uh, to make the show the way that he wanted mm -hmm. FX has been very good about this in the last 10-15 years of finding somebody with a very distinctive vision and wants to do something really different with TV and just kind of giving them the space and the resources to just go do that uh, which I respect them for that uh, sometimes this is like a, so I'm trying to think one one thing that was that maybe would have made the list three years ago if I'd made this list three years ago of course why would you make a list specifically about it being this year three years ago best 10 movies of the last seven years or best 10 movies of the decade so far <laughs> yeah best 10 movies of the decade so far with uh, my predictions in the future of what shows that don't exist yet that I will like more than the shows I'm listing up <laughs> but uh you're the worst had some great moments um by and large though it's in that unfortunate genre of white people misbehaving and waiting for the world to uh take them by the hand and force them to grow up uh the depiction of gretchen's relationship with literally any black person on that show pretty much every black person on that show is a mammy um i'm just gonna be blunt about it um it again like breaking bad has this very misplaced quote unquote empathy for characters doing terrible things which replaces its sense of moral duty or clear headed more any clear headed moral vision that it's bringing to the proceedings um, that's why you're the worst is not on this list I, 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 I enjoyed you're the worst at first and then slowly maybe it was what you're describing as uh, as as growing up and as they as they grow up the show becomes less interesting right it's more interesting when they're immature yeah I but mean, how too, right, right, because you it's about a show, it's a show about people being terrible yeah. that wants to destroy its own premise by making these people grow up in ways that for all of its talk about, you know, oh, this is a show about depression, this is a show that's talking frankly about psychological problems, none of its characters follow a believable psychological arc mm -hmm. relative to the supposed problems they're going through. Jimmy clearly has some form of narcissism narcissistic personality disorder people like that without some pretty extreme like basically narcissistic personality disorder is not a thing where you grow up and grow out of it it's a thing that if you have a very patient and understanding therapist you learn how to manage and then deal with your life mm -hmm. that's the best outcome that uh psychology has been able to come up with yet and just sort of the the whole like like edgar coming into his own but still being like oh jimmy is my bro like if Edgar 
Shepard had actually come into his own, he would have realized that he was in a codependent, basically abusive relationship with Jimmy, and Jimmy was taking advantage. Basically, the, the things that make Jimmy act like a complete, basically abusive asshole to Edgar are the same things that would have attracted him to Gretchen, which is essentially both of them are psychologically vulnerable and in vulnerable states. Um, the, the more that you start peeling away at that show, the uglier it looks. Mm. Uh, from my perspective, personally, Atlanta does not have any of those problems. No, no, it does not. <laughs> I, I just want to say, so, so I, I, I said I enjoyed your, you're the worst. Um, I mean, I did too. I, but, I watched it all the way through while it was on. But this seems, I mean, the, the, the main characters are, are reprehensible. Um, and I, I, I said earlier about that. I can't stand, uh, and I, I, and I, I don't enjoy when the, 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 the anti-hero, mm. the anti-hero shows where the, the, the main characters are, are basically basically bad guys but the difference is that it's a comedy uh, people get their comeuppance sometimes. I don't remember how much some sometimes but I'm so thinking like uh, what, what's his name Paul's uh, uh, not well yeah Lindsay Lindsay uh, the the one who Gretchen's best friend she somehow goes from being like a complete idiot who literally stabs her fiance to they just need her to have character growth so somehow between seasons three and four she just radically becomes this better person without going through anything of any consequence or really having any kind of like and unless it's literally just sort of being an asshole is this fever that we grow out of when we hit the age of 30 or something then it's completely unbelievable just a plot contrivance and that was, that was my biggest issue especially with the later seasons is that they would come up with a joke and then the characterizations were completely inconsistent because they just wanted to land this joke so hard so like oh what's his face Paul the computer pro or the the stockbroker the rich guy in the last season they make him go alt right because he ends up on a cuckold forum because his fiance decides she wants to cheat on him by cuckolding him which is not really even the right use of that word in a sexual context he becomes like he's supposed to be this incredibly smart guy but somehow he ends up on a Nazi forum and can't figure out why he's acting like that he's acting like a Nazi uh -huh. and they just completely throw out that premise three episodes later because they need him to seem like a nice guy so that everybody can make nice at the, at the end of the show. Gotcha. Maybe that's why I stopped watching. I stopped watching it before that. Well, I mean, the fourth <laughs> season was just so bad. I didn't get that far. I think I only watched two seasons. Um, but, but... Uh, I got off on a tangent. Here. Yeah, what, what I was trying to say is that I enjoy uh, comedies that have that if uh, people get their comeuppance. We know, so for example, Veep, I really really like Veep. Mm. Veep, it's a bunch of kind of terrible people trying to, or, oh, or at man. least... Veep might have made the list actually if I'd been thinking about it a bit harder. Okay, you can make it 11. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Honorable mention to Veep, Veep. And, and I'll let Ron talk about Veep. Well, I just want to say that the, the main characters, they're all very self-centered, they're all very selfish, um, but they also, everything that they try, they end up getting their comeuppance, and it's a comedy. Although if they didn't get the just rewards, uh, might still not have been, uh, uh, I, I don't know if I would have enjoyed it in the same way. Actually, so I watched Seinfeld. I binged watch Seinfeld, mm. which was a bad idea because the show tends to be about, you know, selfish people doing selfish things, mm. but they, they they usually they usually sort of lose at the end, right? They're, they're never winners. <laughs> oh, yeah, and the last but, episode is literally about how they're terrible people. Right, so as you start to uh, watching, I think it was nine seasons? Yep. Yeah, watching nine seasons of this, you realize that All these... of which are in a fake refrigerator above Ron's head right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think I only watched that on Netflix, alas. Um, but uh, yeah, you see just all starting, you know, you go through it and you start realizing just these are really terrible people. I can't believe that I'm spending all this time with them. Um, so not just, I mean, the, the, the last episode is a combination. They're, they're, they're called out on it, but they're really terrible people. Um, the first season or so is a little different when stuff like, you know, they're a little friendlier and the lane is uh, big into animal rights. and But no, that all goes away pretty quickly. And I, I think that that's like, that's fundamental to that. 
that show that like I feel like friends they're all terrible people but the show is trying to sell them to us as good people Seinfeld seems to be more about just sort of toxic codependent friendship the people are very funny because we don't have any emotional investment in them like I don't have I love Seinfeld the show but I have no emotional attachment to any of those characters throughout any of the run and that's and I mean the characterizations are pretty consistent episode to episode oh yeah yeah they're they're um, they're barely two-dimensional and the ways that I relate to the characters are not really ways in which I feel better like if I think to myself because I definitely have a lot of George Costanza ish qualities in my real life um I don't feel like watching Seinfeld I don't feel like a better person for the fact that I relate to George Costanza. I just kind of feel like a schmuck, <laughs> right? And so I feel like there's a clearer moral vision to Seinfeld than something like You're the Worst. And I, I think that comes down to like what Larry David said when he's creating it. Like, nobody learns anything. No hugging, no learning. Uh -huh. uh, this is sort of this Samuel Beckett-like hellscape where nothing changes and people just sort of do horrible things for our amusement over and over again. Right. Even in the last episode when they get <laughs> caught and um, they, they haven't learned anything. Right. And they end up in prison and they're literally repeating the same dialogue from the very beginning of the pilot. Yeah. Which is almost more like James Joyce-ish, right? Like a Finnegan's Wake. It begins halfway through a sentence, ends with the beginning half of that sentence. So there's technically no actual beginning or end of the book. Uh -huh. um, wow. You just put James Joyce uh, and you just put Finnegan's Wake in the same category as uh, Seinfeld. Or vice versa. You yeah, just I, mean, I feel like there's a category. lot of Samuel Beckett-ish stuff in Seinfeld. It's kind of, right, because like Samuel Beckett is just sort of, he's obsessed with people being stuck in these weird r repeated routines to avoid any kind of deeper meaning in life almost. And uh, and you get that sense of, of like, is this purgatory or is this hell? And I definitely get that sense when I think too hard when I'm watching Seinfeld. Thinking too hard while watching Seinfeld. That's what I should call my TV book. Thinking too hard while watching Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> um, all right. But anyway, so Atlanta, great watch it. Um, shorts, two seasons. Veep is number 11 now. Veep is number 11. <laughs> uh, Lady Dynamite. What number are we at? Uh, so there's no numbers until number one. Oh, oh okay, okay. One. That's right, that's right. We're, oh, well, we've gone through six of them, so there's only four more to go. Okay. We're waiting now. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, oh, did I accidentally put 11 on here? No, we've got one, two, three, four, right? One, two, three. I I accidentally put 11 shows on here. Okay. No, I'm counting only, wait, I'm counting only four. Oh, wait, oh, no, no, I got rid of, oh, okay, I, I crossed out one of them because I didn't put it on the list, but I used the same pen that I'm using to cross them out as I go along. So. <laughs> okay, so Lady Dynamite, two seasons on Netflix, uh, it stars Maria Bamford as Maria Bamford. Oh! Um, yes! She has clear bipolar disorder and she does not try to mask it at all and boy does it look like bipolar disorder good on her uh, everything has this surreal dreamlike quality Mitchell Hurwitz the creator of Arrested Development another show that's ostensibly about people who are all horrible but it nevertheless is a great show I think because it never really glosses over like it might set up a trap where it's like oh maybe this is empathetic and then you realize like no okay this this is really this person being horrible or self involved <laughs> um, and especially in like very poor politically relevant ways that were like way ahead of the curve. Arrested Development is probably like my top, in my top ten of all time, but uh, Lady Dynamite, two seasons, it's great and Mitchell Hurwitz is kind of let off the reservation. He's not worried. He can do the same kind of layered, strange textural comedy that he pioneered on Arrested Development and that nobody else has really even tried to do except him since Arrested Development, I feel like. Like, nobody... Because it would be like trying to to solve like three Rubik's cubes at the same time using your feet. Like <laughs> uh, I don't know how you could do it, but he uh, he doesn't even have to worry about the plot winding up because it's a show about vibes. But he can still make these densely layered 
joke tapestries. And Maria Bamford, is was, has always been a hilarious uh, comedian. Uh, she turns in a great performance. And it, it's just, it's a very strange place to spend a half an hour. And it's, uh, it's very honest about um, mental health issues, which uh, going through this list, I feel like that's kind of, if there was anything that 2010's TV was grappling with, it was uh, mental health problems. I feel like a lot of that does come down to the fact that, and I'm definitely guilty of this, um, a lot of America does try to self-medicate their mental health problems with television. So the way that you make television that will engage the kind of people who watch a lot of television is to deal directly with mental health issues. I'm trying to remember. So I remember seeing on TV Maria Bamford giving a, a comedy, um, where she was trying to do a comedy routine in front of her parents. Mm. Was that part of the show or was that a comedy uh, a comedy special of hers? Uh, I think it was both. Oh, okay. So her um, her parents on the show, not her real parents. Um, oh, God, I forget. Her father on the show, he's on Arrested Development, too, is the guy at uh, Sitwell, whose hair keeps falling off. He's a pretty famous actor, but I can't remember his name. There is a point where she's kind of doing this stand-up routine that's clearly not funny, becomes kind of alarming, and her family is just sort of like, no, you're having a manic episode. This isn't funny right now. We need to bring you back to reality. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a very powerful and affecting scene on the show. Yeah. Um, well worth your time. I think it got kind of buried in the hype for a lot of other things that were not as well done. Uh, Fred Melamed, as her dad? Uh, no, he's her agent. Okay. And then, oh, uh, right, right. her dad is uh, him, him, Ed Begley Jr. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Star of Transylvania 651, 65,000. Oh, okay. Uh, which which we discussed briefly on the Your Podcast, Your Podcast or Mine episode. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that's... Because it was a reference to an earlier episode of Your Podcast or Mine. <laughs> It's all connected. You're We're all living in one giant Thomas Pynchon novel. <laughs> That's the secret moral of the internet. Your podcast are mine. Mm. So, uh, Rick and Morty. What more can I say about Rick and Morty? It's, uh, again, Dan Harmon is the Kanye West of television sitcoms. <laughs> Yet again, he takes the Jeff character from Community, morphs him into this alcoholic version of the Doc from Back to the Future and consistently makes half-hour short movies with Justin Roiland that are vastly better than Back to the Future. It's torn apart everything from capitalism to heist movies. It makes me laugh probably as much as anything on TV except for the number one pick on my list, which is not on anymore, so Rick and Morty is top of the heap in terms of that for now. And just kind of the endless... The endless inventiveness of the show. Uh, you can tell that they've been freed from the budget constraints of traditional animation. They take full advantage of that. Any crazy idea that comes into their head, they're just going to follow it to its conclusion. The voice acting is hilarious. You never quite know what you're going to get week to week. And uh, it just takes on the idea of television itself. And a lot of the problems in the larger culture uh, more intelligently than a lot of shows that don't feature intergalactic sex robots. Um, <laughs> you, um, Dan, Dan Harmon was the showrunner? Uh, he is the showrunner. He is, yeah. oh, is he, the showrunner. Uh, he's the guy who created Community. Okay, okay. Right. That's the second time you mentioned Dan Harmon. I think there was, uh, where, where were the two? Um, well, I think uh, when, when we were talking about Atlanta, uh, Community came up because yeah. Donald Glover left Community to do Atlanta. No, but I think you also mentioned, uh, was it, uh, the, the showrunner for Arrested Development? Was, was the showrunner uh, for something else here? Oh, yeah, Mitchell Hurwitz was the showrunner for both Arrested Development and Lady Dynamite. Oh, okay. So, Bamford. So, so just now, um, when you're talking about the shows, you're talking about you're talking about the writers and the writing. So you're talking about, the sh hence, the showrunner. When I was talking about the movies, I almost uh, I almost never mentioned uh, the directors or the writers, except for, uh, I think, Adam McKay for The Big Short. And But mostly I've been talking, I, I was talking about sort of the, 
uh, well, the, the, I guess the movie as a whole and mentioning the actors in it, which I wonder how much of that is is just uh, uh, personal differences or also a, uh, a difference between uh, sort of what's not sparks, but but what's what what drives a movie. Um, although not mentioning the director for for movies, I'm actually surprised they didn't. <laughs> well, I think with TV, you're dealing with such a huge object, right? Because like even the shortest piece of TV, like the shortest thing on this list, well, besides show about the show, would probably be Lady Dynamite. Um, or no, no, because Atlanta aired with ads, so Atlanta is probably like 20 minutes shorter than, although Atlanta is going to continue and mm-hmm. soon be longer than Lady Dynamite. The shortest thing we're talking about here is about five hours mm-hmm. uh, at the longest. Like Breaking Bad, we're talking about literally 62 hours worth of stuff. So the only way to talk about the thing as a unified object with clear intentions, especially because in in like, and this is more prevalent comedy shows, but it, it's kind of across the board. Um, getting a writing credit on a TV show basically just means that you were the person who was set out to do the grunt work on that episode. Mm-hmm. It eventually, to create coherence in, in the overall structure of the episode and the show as a whole, it has to go through the showrunner. Um, so the showrunner is as close as you get in an enterprise like television to the kind of French idea, the auteur Mm -hmm. person who I can kind of like go at the show and be like, okay, it intended to do this, it did this, or it failed to do this, or it failed to do that. And so it just makes it a more unified, and uh, it makes it a, an easy, it makes it easier for me to cut it down into bite-sized chunks where I can actually talk about something, whereas if I was just taking like very specific individual pieces of it, I feel like it would be like grabbing at stuff in the ocean, you know, like there's just so much stuff to go through. But TV shows are all about the show showrunners um not the directors uh the director you can have a mediocre director you could just bring in it you know i will say oh, yeah, anyone yeah. Um, almost and, anyone i mean they had diane keaton direct an episode of the original twin peaks and you can't tell the difference yeah yeah the the, the same person that directed heaven <laughs> that wrote and directed heaven mm. yeah. oh i hate that movie or it wasn't so much that i hated that movie it's that if the people that she was interviewing if those are the people going to heaven i have no interest in going to heaven <laughs> maybe that's what turned me into an atheist and i think like having seen multiple shows by a single showrunner in this case community and uh, let's let's we'll stick with Rick and Morty for now mm. um, you see these very obvious overlaps and I think I'm going to say I mean, you can see that even more in the next thing I'm going to bring up on the list but Rick and Morty Rick Sanchez is essentially the Jeff Winger character on community just sort of on steroids right like he's a guy who thinks he knows everything and he's smart enough to use that to get into trouble and eventually has to face the fact that like he's kind of an asshole mm-hmm. which is from all uh, accounts from the outside seems to be Dan Harmon's great struggle in life which he is like outwardly acknowledged um, pretty pretty clearly um, it's interesting that uh, uh, or I think it's notable that you know Rick Sanchez probably Hispanic I don't <laughs> think <you know. laughs> but 100% correct cartoon character right right. (laughs) but how often do you get cartoon uh uh cartoon characters uh in which the uh hispanic character gets top billing uh rubik the amazing cube and then never again for another 28 years i think (laughs) (laughs) or i mean door is door the explorer i was just looking that up and and apparently you know you, you think so but apparently that's not actually explicitly stated okay um you know and door is not a particularly uh um and i mean they don't really portray rick sanchez as being particularly like ethnic like no nobody in the sanchez family really seems to be hispanic in any way shape or form no not at all neither does he um um uh, sorry uh yeah neither neither does he right so i mean if you just saw me like you know (laughs) generic white (laughs) i mean i think rick and morty it was also important because it managed to push adult swim out of this very bad direction it was going for a while uh, where it was just sort of these I mean I know people that swear by these shows I didn't personally didn't really like any of them but after Tim and Eric got big like and, and I love Tim and Eric awesome show it's like un, uneven but they they got a lot of things very 
rewrite. After that, though, you had all these, like, 12-minute, like, here's a parody of a medical show. Here's a parody of an action show. Here, and, and live action, and I just didn't think any of them were that good or nearly as inventive as the stuff that Adult Swim made its its uh, its name on. Mm -hmm. uh, and with Rick and Morty coming on, um, it kind of pushed them, it forced them into a new direction, right? Because they couldn't keep doing Space Ghost clones forever. They ran out of shows to can to like buy out from other networks. Um, and then they were just sort of this, uh, they were the home of low effort sketch comedy basically for a while. What do you think of, um, what do you think of Robot Chicken? I loved the pilot when it aired because I remember when that originally aired because I'm getting old. Uh -huh. And then the longer it went on, the more it seemed like the, man, Seth Green thinks he's really a lot funnier than he is show. <laughs> um, and the fact that it was animated with toys did not help it. Um, but anyway, so so go ahead. <laughs> for I'm, I, I like the show, although I can't watch too much of it at once, and it is... It, it, it's uneven. He, he gets on my nerves a little bit because, like, I liked everything else. Do you ever see Greg the Bunny? The yep. show he did before that. And I really like parts of that show, but his general vibe just kind of... He gives me David Schwimmer vibes. <laughs> which, you have to listen to our previous episode to find out what David Schwimmer vibes means. Or you could figure it out from the context because you're probably a, a competent adult. Yeah, just if you didn't catch it, Dan is... <laughs> A, is a David Schwimmer super fan. Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, I I love that man. I have uh, I have a lipstick stained 8 by 10 of him <laughs> next to my mirror. So, speaking of mirrors, Black Mirror, um, I have been watching this since basically right when it got to the U.S. because before Netflix got a hold of it, several years before Netflix got a hold of it, when it was technically canceled, uh, it originally aired on Channel 4, which is in England, that's like the big TV station that isn't the BBC. I think there's like that and Sky TV are the only uh, the only three TV stations in England you ever really hear about. Uh, when it initially came over to the U.S., it was on the TV Guide channel. No, are you serious? Because they got the rights to it because it was just this canceled six episode British thing. And I managed to get a, I saw like the Onion AV Club did a quick write up on National Anthem, which is the pilot. Everybody knows it as the episode episode where the Prime Minister fucks a pig. Yep, I've definitely seen that one. Yep, and I watched through all six episodes in one night Ooh. of the original run. And Ooh, I was that's just tough. like, oh my god, this is this is a, the second episode is still one of my all-time favorite episodes of TV, period. Uh, uh, two million credits, I think it's called. What's it about? It's the one where they're all basically living inside a cell phone, playing Candy Crush for a living. Uh -huh. And the one guy tries to save up enough credits to get this woman that he has a crush on. Oh, yeah. Uh, a, um, an audition on this, like, sadistic version of American Idol. And I just think it's probably the most brilliant takedown of the entire gig economy that was ever written. And it was done pretty early into the gig economy. Uh -huh. Well, not that early. I mean, I think that aired, like, that actually technically aired before the purview, I think, of this list, but... Oh, okay. Wait, was it that long ago? It was a long... Yeah. Oh, okay. So it was off the air for, like, a good three years before Netflix was, like, oh, we're bringing this back. Okay. I, I, I know I've seen the first season. All, all what, six episodes? Uh, no, the first season... First and second season were both three episodes. Three episodes. Oh, okay, then I must have watched season one That and was the entire two. original run of it. Yeah, the last one is the one where the cartoon bear starts running for office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I started finding I was having a hard time handling the show. It was it was too disturbing. Um, and uh, I really liked it. Mm. And I thought it was well done. And and for a while, it's like, oh my God, I've got to see more. I've got to see more. And then I watched too much of it at once. And it's like, I don't ever want to watch another episode again. I, I, I'll never sleep um, <laughs> for the rest of my life. I don't know what the point of all that was. No, no. I mean, that's like the vibe you get from it. And the thing is, the, uh, the, the showrunner, we go back to the showrunner, and also the best writer on the show, the guy who wrote all but one of the original six episodes, which I would still hold as the all-time high point of the show. Although I, I have liked a lot of the Netflix episodes. He was just on fire for those six episodes. Um, he was actually running basically the British equivalent of The Daily Show at the time. Uh-huh. 
uh, which, which was called Screen Wipe. And if you want just like kind of a funny talk showy explanation of how literally everything on TV works behind the scenes, I can't recommend it highly enough. I think it's still on YouTube, but Screen Wipe with Charlie Brooker. He also did the six episode sitcom called Nathan Barley that just destroys the early internet culture. Okay. Um, it's so good. Hmm. Um, and he just kind of goes after like this version of E-Bomb's e world that is called the trashbad.co.ck. <laughs> um, so, so, so far, so far here, I need to watch this and I need to watch Bojack Horseman um, as things that I haven't seen yet and that come highly recommended. Is that yeah, Screen Wipe, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, for like 20 year, almost 20 year old reviews of TV stuff, like it's, it was clear that Charlie Brooker was going to do very special things later on and uh -huh. then he kind of fulfilled that with Black Mirror but he's been like one of the busiest guys in British TV for almost 20 years now Wow. Uh, I realized you, earlier uh, when I said, uh, I don't know, I don't remember what I was talking about. <laughs> um, what what I was what I was thinking of was, and part of the reason why I probably watched, stopped watching Black Mirror is at home on my own, when I'm just on my own, I like to watch comedies. Great. I save the dramas for going to the movie theater, or not even going to the movie theater, but I save the dramas for watching with friends. I have a harder time with, uh, with dramas on my own. So, you know, also at home, I'm watching a movie I usually just want to be entertained not I won't say not it's not that I don't want to feel too much it's just for those kind of feelings I guess I want other people around mm -hmm. huh okay I'm I'm, I'm psychologic I'm psychologicalizing myself <laughs> Psychoanalyzing. Well, I was avoiding the word psychoanalyzing because <laughs> that that has a very specific meaning. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're you're not like you're not going all Freud on yourself. I'm right? not going all Freud on myself. Right. Psychoanal psychoanalysis would be you know tied to that or, or well some of the different schools. Uh, Sometimes yeah. a TV show is just a TV show. <laughs> well, <laughs> sometimes it's good enough to make Dan's top ten list. <laughs> so uh, so that was Black Mirror. Yeah, Black Mirror, uh, the original run, and I mean. The the Netflix stuff is all pretty. I mean, it's on. It's way more uneven than the original run. But the original run, that's like, uh, yeah, that's like six of the best hours of TV I've ever seen. Period. Just one after another. Um, I agree. Just despite my saying, I I, I I stopped watching the show, then I couldn't handle it. But I probably if I'm sitting, well, with that's somebody. almost a compliment though, because like TV usually that, that's a feat. Because like TV wants you to keep watching. That's the whole reason TV exists right? right like and and so if you can pull that off on tv and get somebody to pay for it <laughs> it's pretty uh if it makes you stop watching because it's good that's kind of an achievement in its own weird way yeah. okay okay yeah that makes sense because there's like things where i have to stop watching because it's just like stupid and it's insulting my right. intelligence right and that it's not quite like that so we're down to number two which is not actually number two but it's the thing before what i designate as number one Hannibal. Yeah. Number two out of, well, it turns out to be 10 because this is a top 11 list. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> 12 if we include community. Right. <laughs> um, so this is two of 10 or 11. So this is, we're still in the kind of whatever order. The only things that I put in a specific order, I guess outside of the last second editions, were Breaking Bad is definitely a number 10. And number one is definitely a number one. And I'm going to save number one for, you know. As a surprise, it's the mystery the we're finale, looking for. Yeah. yeah. The big reveal. But so number two in the unnumbered wasteland is... Is Hannibal. Uh, oh, interesting. Did you see that? No, uh, no, I've not. It's it's pretty gruesome, and it's pretty. I mean, if you could make it through Black Mirror, I wouldn't watch this by yourself in your apartment. Okay, it's pretty freaky. But uh, it's to go back to the 2010s, were the age of psychological problems on TV. Um, to go back to that kind of impromptu thesis, I guess uh, Hannibal is one of the best, if not the best, TV depiction of post-traumatic stress disorder I've ever seen. Um, the, uh, I mean, have you seen any of the, like, Silence of the Lambs or 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, any so, of those movies. Silence of the Lambs. Uh, wait, wasn't the sequel called Hannibal? Yep. Okay. And then... Hannibal Rising was another one. And then there's the Michael Mann one that's just called Manhunter from the 80s. Yeah, yeah. I remember when that came out. Uh, oh, isn't one of, is one of them called Red Dragon? Uh, or, or yeah, Red Dragon was the book. Okay, was right, the book right. that uh, Manhunter was based on. Okay, none of the and movies were most of uh, Hannibal, the TV show, the first season or so, is basically this, like, very interesting, or, no, is it, I think the third season, one of the seasons is basically an adaptation of Red Dragon, um, and, yeah, it kind of takes this basic kind of crazy cat love triangle between this investigator who can, who has the ability to empathize with serial killers, and it's driving him crazy because he's not, he doesn't have the psychological makeup of one, so he's just sort of walking into these crime scenes and seeing this horrific stuff in his head that helps him solve crimes. Hannibal Lecter, who is portrayed on the show as essentially the the ultimate moral bankruptcy of the rich in culture. Um, he sort of, he sees culture as about being about him being superior to other people, and then he proves that to himself by killing other people, uh, often in like brutal, kind of clever ways that were not presented with on the show as being clever. It's presented as um, I mean, it's probably the single, the uh, Mads Mikkelsen's portrayal of Hannibal on this show is probably the best single portrayal of actual psychopathy I've ever seen on television. Um, Are we supposed to empathize with him? Empathize with him? Not really at all. Okay. No, I mean, we kind of, we're supposed to be it's it's a weird show because like Will Graham, the investigator, is very easy to empathize with because at the end of the day, he's the simple guy who's given this horrific burden that he's the only guy who can solve these crimes. But in order to solve these crimes, he just has to basically repeatedly re-traumatize himself. Uh, Hannibal Lecter is in love with him because and uh, because he sees Will Graham as the only person who actually understands him. Like Clarice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, it it goes all over the place. The dialogue is just beautiful, um, not in the sense of like like beautiful like a spring day, but just sort of it goes a lot of deep places. It doesn't mince words, and you can go back and look at it and just sort of pick it apart in a lot of different ways and keep coming up with interesting, valid, and insightful interpretations. Um, it's very gruesome, and it does have the bojack. Jack Horseman problem where like the first four or five episodes it looks like it's just going to be a crappy gory version of CSI. <laughs> uh, once it gets past that first couple episode hump though, it's by far the best extrapolation of showrunner Brian Fuller's themes throughout his larger body of work which includes Wonder Falls, Pushing Daisies uh, where he's he's been repeated every all three of his major shows. I think even Dead Like Me. I, I forget the exact part Miss a dead like me. I haven't watched that all the way through, but um, uh, I think she teenager. No, no, she's a young woman dies. Um, and she ends up becoming someone who helps other dead people move on to uh, the afterlife. I believe. And Mandy Patinkin is uh, not her boss, uh, sort of her supervisor or her her team lead. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So he who helps. He gives her the assignments that we don't know quite where he gets them from. He's obsessed with like the line between brilliance and madness. And also with people talking to dead things or inanimate objects. Because his first show, one season long, I, I do love this show, although it's nowhere near as good as Hannibal. Uh, Wonder Falls. It's about a woman who works at a gift shop in Niagara Falls. And suddenly inanimate objects start talking to her and telling her to start solving other people's problems. <laughs> What's the name of the show? Uh, Wonder Falls. Okay. I got it over there if you want to borrow I think you'd probably enjoy it, honestly. It's like, oh, okay goofy comedy. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Pushing Daisies. I don't know if you ever saw any of that. Sounds really familiar. I mean, it, it's very familiar and I can't remember what it's about. This uh, this guy basically has this power where he can touch a dead person and for a minute they come back to life, but if he doesn't touch them again to kill them, someone else in the immediate vicinity has to die. Okay. And then he starts a detective agency to solve mysteries. And he has this, uh, he has this very bizarre sex 
sexless romance with this other woman that works at the pie shop that he frequents because if he physically touches her, she dies. Okay. Um, Wait, so... Which I guess kind of comes back to the Hannibal Will Graham relationship where there is this weird kind of like highly distanced, but at least in Hannibal's mind, romantic slash almost sexual relationship between the two of them. Between Hannibal and... Hannibal and, and Will Graham. You know, oh, okay, is, okay. Right? Because, like, Hannibal's smart enough where if he just wanted to go kill Will Graham, he could go uh-huh. kill... And he kills other people that come across his path, etc., etc. And he likes to eat them, which, you know, is, is from, from the, the books and the, the overall series. So by that, too, the relationship sound, sounds a little bit like Clarice and Hannibal in The Silence of the Lambs. Quid pro quo bloody. Right. I did that wrong. Quid pro quo bloody. Oh, wow. I can't and, even Yeah, it. yeah. And, and like, Silence of the Lands is kind of a... It's the first two books in the Hannibal series sort of... They meld bits and pieces of both of them, I think, into that movie. Okay. But Will Graham, to follow the talking to dead people in animate objects thing, when we see him at these crime scenes, yeah, he sort of... He sees these dead bodies, and then he can see the, psycholo- the psychological profile of the person who killed them. He sees them... In is almost these aesthetic objects that he can analyze like a piece of art and he's repulsed by the fact that he's able to do this and it just sort of gets deeper from there and I don't know how it managed to stay on the air for three straight years given that it, it it's just such a weird and disturbing show but it was so well done it's a show about somebody who eats other people <laughs> yes and it's a show that has like a deep clarity of moral vision about a man who eats other people because he's a smug psychopath which is incredibly difficult to look at at times uh, as it should be you know it shouldn't be fun or exciting to look at something like that you know what that probably I don't know it it definitely it it could get my number two spot overall so number one okay to kind of go back a little bit Nathan for you Nathan Fielder comes up with insane ideas to help struggling small businesses if uh, the podcast would like to come talk about Nathan for you. She is uh, more than welcome to because we have watched so much of this together. <laughs> but she doesn't look like that's what she wants to come in for. And this is my favorite <laughs> TV show of the last decade because it because of the openness with which Nathan Fielder approaches the world. I think the podcast wants to say something. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just like wiggling. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. So she. <laughs> All right, we're almost done. We're on number one. So Nathan Fielder, uh, he approaches approaches the world with this incredible openness, hoping to be surprised, and that's what I love so much about this show. Also, just the bizarre, it's like the only prank show that doesn't seem like it's making fun of the people that it's doing pranks on, and in fact, the pranks are almost this pretext for this bizarre and singular form of performance art that only Nathan Fielder seems to understand or be able to pull off. I don't think we're ever going to see another show like Nathan for you just because how the hell would you do it? Like, I can't figure out how he's coming up with the ideas for half of these episodes when I'm on there. The way that he can kind of uh, come up with this premise, vaguely guess how it's going to play out, and almost cast these real-life people in something like a drama that's nonetheless surprising, often, like, touchingly beat uh, and it had probably my favorite episode of TV of the decade which is the uh, the episode with the gas station rebate did you ever see that uh, I don't remember I, I've seen so many of it I I, mm. I, I thought it was a great show and just uh, in, in terms of not not never seeing a show like this again if you boil it down to one sentence it's a guy pranking people um, and that puts it then in the category of anywhere from candid camera to punked mm. and anywhere in between that doesn't capture it at all. Yeah, it's like this weird, it's like a an autobiography of this man who has trouble emotionally relating to people. It's a deep and incredibly subtle critique, or I, subtle maybe isn't the right word, um, deep and penetrating critique of everything that's wrong with capitalism <laughs> in the 
20 pens, and I don't think he ever quite got it any better than the gas station rebate episode, which is, uh, he goes to this struggling gas station, he says, all right, I have a, because the, the premise is he goes to these struggling small businesses, and he, uh, he gives them what are these very bizarre ideas for promotions, and then lets them run out. Well, he went to business school, so he, right. he knows the stuff, right? He went to one of Canada's top business schools with really great, with really good grades. And by really good, it was what, like B's and C's, I think? That entire intro sequence is just one subtle but hilarious gag after another. Yeah. Right, because like, there's a thing where it uh, they're like, we'll fix your business or something, and there's the outside of the shoe store, and it's literally just the shots color graded differently <laughs> after it's fixed. Um, so many tiny little details, but the gas station rebate episode, he, um, he goes to this gas station and he says, all right, we're going to do a rebate where the gas is half price, but in order to claim the rebate, they have to drop their receipt in a box at the top of a mountain that's hidden and that only Nathan Fielder knows where it is. And the idea being that everybody goes in for the half price gas and then they get, they have to pay for full price gas. The guy makes money. But Nathan Fielder hires a bus just in case anybody would be crazy enough to go to the top of this hill to try to put in this drop box rebate. And he ends up camping overnight <laughs> with these, like, four of the strangest people I've ever seen on television. They have, like, deep conversations about the one guy's divorce and the other person's um, just, just, like, all this different stuff. And every Every time they're talking about how much they're hoping for this rebate, and this is maybe the funniest thing I saw on TV in the last 10 years, it flashes the exact amount of their rebates. These people have been camping out on a hill for like 36 hours. They'll say something, it'll say, Steve, blah, 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 $14.32. <laughs> <laughs> and and at the same time, like, it could be this very judgmental thing where it's like, oh, man, look at the length somebody will go for a tiny bit of money. But at the end, it ends up being about how far they'll go to find an emotional connection with another person. They're willing to literally follow this, like, complete stranger into the woods for two days on the premise of getting a gas station rebate. And the premise of getting $14. Right. Um, I think the, the highest well, no, they don't, rebate. Well, and they never get it, right? <laughs> because he's the only one. He's the only one who eventually gets the rebate and it, it's just such he takes such a seemingly stock stupid premise and takes it to these lengths that I just and I could I could just watch that show all the way through like over and over again that's why it's my number one of the last 10 years and you did not spoil it by giving all the details of that episode if anything if anything now I really want to go back and watch it because I'm guessing it was mm. in one of the later seasons no this was the this fourth was episode of the whole show oh wow okay it was like on fire for from the beginning and also uh if you if you can't get enough nathan fielder he did similar segments that weren't quite as developed on the canadian equivalent of the daily show which was called this or it's still on it's called this hour has 22 minutes and the segments are called nathan on your side so is this an ex is this an extension of that uh this is what comedy central saw to pick him up to full series okay so it's sort of him with the pro it, it, it's the concept in incubation it's still really fun Funny, but it's just like two minute segments and a lot of them are on YouTube but yeah so that was my top 10 of the decade okay. oh, oh so, well, was just just about Nathan for you uh, the reason I was asking if it was a later season is is that I don't remember it and I, I've seen several seasons but it's possibly there I didn't see the first season or I just don't remember the episode mm. I don't remember a lot so I could go watch it again now and be laughing for the first time mm. but it, I don't know the show's kind of spoiler proof everything you describe right now is that just sort of the, the outline right it's really about the progression and everything that happens in between that's uh and like somehow this guy who who like we initially meet telling a yogurt store to sell poop flavored yogurt becomes the most multi-dimensional character on television of the last 10 years at least i mean i don't know if he's like quite as i don't know like he's he's definitely one of the, the like most complicated tv protagonists 
artists of all time, I think. So this is uh, that, uh, this has been Dan with uh, my top 10 TV shows of the last 10 years, uh, also known as the 2010s for when you have to go through the, uh, the top 10 of the 2020s, in which episode hindsight will be, well, 2020. <laughs> um, yeah, so until next time. This is Ron. This is Dan. This has been a nominee. Take care.